Hayesta. Hey. It's Tanya Denning Orman this week from NITV. Oh my God, I love her. And NITV is pretty cool too. I know, both their stories are amazing, really. And we're going to hear about them in a minute. Perfect timing for National Reconciliation Week. Get on with it then. Oh, okay. <laughs> And welcome to Running Free Skills. This week is a real pleasure for me because I love NITV. They make extraordinary programs and I'm really proud that we're here today to celebrate NITV. But also there's someone I think of as a really, really brilliant leader and a wonderful person to head up NITV. She's Tanya Denning Orman and she's joining us today. Hello. Oh, hi. Thanks for having me. It's really exciting to be here chatting to you. <laughs> I love it. Um, I think we're like, we wanted to talk to you for two reasons. One is I'm fascinated by your career and what's led you to where you are. But also this year will be the 13th birthday in July of NITV. And you've been a part of it since, you know, from day dot. So I think it's a great opportunity to hear more about that in a minute. Yes, you're becoming a teenager. <laughs> oh, God forbid. An unruly one, I hope. <laughs> um, let's start though by talking a little bit about your background um i'm fascinated to know about your upbringing because i was reading the other day that under the aboriginal protection act your family was actually removed from your traditional land tell me about that um so with my nana particularly um she was taken away from her family at the age of 10 um really tragically um, in the middle of the night, the police came. Her parents had just passed away from tuberculosis outside of Bowen. And um, there were other family members that her and her little sister could have gone to, but they were taken, um, uh, you know, in the middle of the night by the um, police at the time and whisked um, by a boat. Imagine a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old little girl um, moved over to Palm Island. Prior to Palm Island, of course, they um, back then they would have been taken to Phantom Island, as they, um, which was where what they called leper colony. So from that age, my nana was, um, you know, administered by the Aboriginal Protection Act of Queensland, and then by the time she had my mother, um, which was in 1951 uh, um, at Kingaroy, she was. Um, you know, luckily didn't get my mum taken away from her, but you were a part of the act. My nana was um, a domestic and she had my mum um, on a station. So back then, I guess it all depended on the circumstances, the mission managers and the permission. And um, luckily for us, my um, nana was able to keep my mum. And um, at that stage, um, her life was being shipped around between the different missions or the different stations for servitude in Queensland. So with your mum, how did, like, how did she cope? Did she just like, did she manage? And, and, and I know that she ended up marrying a British migrant or immigrant. Um, tell me a bit, a bit about her life, just briefly. Yeah, no, um, mum is an incredible woman. I, you know, she's my mum. So, but it was tough. It was tough. My grandfather was forever asking permission to leave the community of Warabinda. Um, he was a truck driver and he kept on asking, could we leave? Could we leave? Um, could we start to keep our money that we're earning? Um, of course, all the money my nana earned as a servant, she never received. So it was all um, to be under the protection. So uh, as in the Aboriginal Protection Act meant that the money was um, in trust in, a, in the state of Queensland. So my grandfather was forever asking and eventually I think my mum was in um, early high school at the time and moved to Hewenden, I think, and which is out western Queensland. I remember asking mum what that was like and, you know, she was really excited to get to go to that school but um, straight away for the first time in her life is what she was telling me. She really felt like a stranger in her own land in the sense that 
when you're growing up in the mission, you're in the community and you don't know anything else, I guess. And you're in, you know, um, the memories and what she'll say, there's always hardship and there's a lot of cruelty. There's a lot of love within the families. Um, when you lose your family in the Aboriginal communities, you, you gain more families anyway. You're never without a grandmother. You're never without kin. So, um, you know, mum would, you know, mum still has all her family and, you know, friends mm. from those sort of, um, times. But it was tough. And mum wanted to leave. She wanted to move on and go somewhere else. And, um, you know, I think she was like 17 and, um, she was serving petrol at the local Jeringa fuel station and um, that's where she met my dad who kept on needing fuel um, <laughs> and um, my dad look I'm a benefactor of the um, white Australia policy in the sense that my dad immigrated to Australia as what I guess was fondly called as a 10 pound pom he made 10 pound by moving to Australia essentially he was escaping his um I say escaping in a fondest way, but the way his, uh, uh, my dad's family are dairy farmers upon hundreds of years. So we're from Devon on that side in England and he did not want to be a dairy farmer. So he, um, you know, he got on a plane and dad fell in love in what was or is still today a beautiful black woman. And um, from that moment, I think, you know, mum was 17, dad was, you know, 27. And um, ever since then, you know, both he's been besotted, he's still besotted and, you know, they just celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. <laughs> so I'm very privileged to have grown up in a, a world that has been, I guess, a different experience to many Australians. Let's move on to your career. So you wanted to be a journalist and you became a journalist with the ABC. Is that how, and, and why did you want to be a journalist? Earlier on, you know, I grew up in a mining town called Blackwater, so um, that which is out near Warabinda. Um, so that was, I thought, the centre of the universe. I loved it as a small town 80s kid. Um, and, you know, we, I grew up on a, a, a what was called the Railway Reserve and that was where a lot of the blackfellas were and it was a, an awesome upbringing you know, out on going out bush and just playing out bush all the time. And then... You know, it was interesting. I'd go over the tracks into the school and what was being taught at school, you know, very 1980s, like Joe Biopity Peterson era in Queensland, mm. very much mm. about, um, you know, I remember just being five or six and starting primary school and we were still singing God Save the Queen. And, you know, by the time I started to understand the world more in the high school years, um, it was becoming really apparent to me that a lot of information um, our schools or people were getting were not um, not the information I knew and was not the world I was growing up in. As you know, I learned pretty early that this um, bad public perception, um, it was, you know, leading to a lot of bad public decisions. Um, perception being, uh, you know, the mostly people got images of Indigenous Australia through media because we were, you know, that 80s or, you know, that generation where whatever was on that box or whatever was being said on the radio, you took um, as, you know, gospel. Uh, and so no one was questioning it. You didn't have that many um, media players in the market either. So... I wanted to, um, you know, give voice um, and actually help to, you know, do my thing to help balance information. Um, but um, I was lucky I had an older brother and sister who managed to pave the way to go to university. Um, so I started to see, well, maybe I could possibly go to university as well. And, um, you know, being... It, I cannot underestimate the role of mentors and the role of... Um, seeing what you potentially can be and that impact that that had on my life. Um, you know, a few years ago, I, I saw, when I was a kid, I saw an Aboriginal woman reading the news and it was the most interesting moment of my life because she was so well-spoken but so much full of authority as well. And seeing that, you know, these sort of little steps and triggers in my life um, you know, made it possible for me to dare think 
that I could possibly leave my small town and, um, you know, make it within the media. And so I went to university and I kept on knocking on the door of the ABC. I was, you know, not interested in the commercials world at all. I just really wanted to get into the ABC because at that stage it was potentially, that was where I could see I could be. And um, I kept on getting rejected. <laughs> you know, I was at uni, um, you know, come back next year. And I don't know where I got the gumption, um, but I just kept on trying. And, you know, which is, you know, a lot of sort of when I think back then, I was really anxious over it, but something kept on pushing me forward. And, um, you know, I, I think I just had a lot of strength and the family around me to believe that I could and um, eventually the ABC let me in um, and, you know, I freelanced. I did work for them for free first and then um, I did some work at Triple J and then uh, eventually I got the gold that I wanted and that was to become a cadet journalist for ABC News and Current Affairs. Wow, that's a great story. Let's, let's talk about NITV because you've been involved with them from the start. Um, so we won't recap that, but... I mean, it has been a hell of a road for NITV and it's only in comparatively recent times that the, the partnership with SBS, which has strengthened you enormously as a broadcaster. But you were incredibly young, really, to step up and be channel manager we, when you did. I believe you were one of the youngest. You must have been the youngest, I would have thought. Was like, did you always hope you would lead NITV or were you just really in on it because you wanted to help and work on it? What was your aim? Well, I initially had my own production company when I got tapped on the shoulder originally um, to either help work on the first um, program for NITV or to be part of the commissioning team. So I ended up um, commissioning its first show. So I, I did both. And at that stage, um, being a producer, not, you know, the idea of a regular paycheck was quite alluring. <laughs> so I thought, I'll just do this for a little bit. It'd be really good to understand that broadcasting world. I'd done the news and current affairs world, but I really wanted to understand how broadcasters thought. And I thought, I'll do that for a little bit. And then um, I'd go back on my merry way to the production company. And I soon realised... Um, I hate not finishing a job and it's taken me a bit to realise I'll never finish, <laughs> you know, it's about, you know, what you do for that particular point. But back then, um, so it was a case of, no, I didn't think I would run the channel one day, but in my interview, I recall being asked by the that former CEO at the time, Pat Turner, um, where do you think you'll go? And I said to her, well, I'll run this place one day, very cheekily. And, um, I, you know, it was, I think, and saying that to someone like Pat, she would have loved, um, you know, a young Aboriginal woman at the time having that belief. Um, so I totally turned 360 from the girl trying to um, jump on um, the ABC. And I just think, um, so I was in my, at that stage when I was interviewed, I was in my late 20s. Um, or early 30s for the job and you know I think um, I, there's that confidence that you have with you which I probably don't have as much as I used to it's a bit more being knocked down and getting back up being knocked down and getting back up than I um, you know back then that I had um, but at that point I was really at an interesting pinnacle of my um, professional career of being able to go it was sliding doors I, I was um, winning I had you know some real um, amazing accolades and experiences and um, could have you know I thought okay I'll go in and try in the independent space again and then I was just really um, I guess allured into this idea of business and this idea of what this channel could become and the fact that it was so hard and there were lots of tears and lots of sort of moments where, you know, you thought it was a sinking ship. Well, it, you know, at one stage there it really seemed to be. But then there were the winds and then there was the, you know, you go out to a community and you see all these young Murrays or these you know, wearing the shirt and, you know, doing the symbol and just you saw that despite the challenges, the winds were overcoming 
then? I mean, I think that one of the key moments when I realised, I mean, having read a lot of what you've said in the past, how important NITV is, was the um, Quaid and Bale story. And just to briefly recap on that, it's a story of his mum posted this video of this child in utter distress and it went completely viral and the family got offers from all around the world including from the Allen um, show in America but they chose NITV and I thought oh my god that is amazing because it's so appropriate what did you feel when you heard of that decision by the family I you know I know the team were just they felt extremely proud um, and felt that, you know, we were, we're really shifting gears because this was one of the biggest stories in the world um, at the time, um, you know, and it still should be at the forefront, the bullying um, of children or within, you know, children. And it was, um, I was mixed though. It was mixed in the sense that you know, we've come a long way as a channel to have the trust and respect. And, you know, the news team have probably been the hardest working team to grow because they've really started from scratch from a five minute rip and read to really ensuring we had integrity with our perspective. So ensuring yeah. what is Indigenous perspective over yeah. world affairs, over current affairs. Um, why I say mixed is the fact that there's still that distrust that many of our communities have with media. Yeah. And the reason why the family wanted to go with us is, yes, they said, well, we trust NITV, we respect NITV, that you're not going to use this against us or in the wrong way. Quaden, um, we'd been consistent with covering stories with Quaden exactly. as well. So we had the relationship and, um, you know, that it really showed why we have a national Indigenous television yeah. service. Yeah, absolutely. And I must say, I thought Jordan Perry did a really, really good job on that piece. It was lovely. Yeah. So let's um, spin through some of the other programs that you've got on offer. Um, and, and, you know, you, you're breaking new ground all the time. And... Um, I don't even know, is it Thalu, if I pronounced it correctly? The live children's program that you launched in April? That is gorgeous. And again, it comes from a place that is not white people thinking about how Aboriginal programs should be made. It comes from the heart. Those kids are amazing. And how important is children's TV to you? Uh, it's um, essential essential part of NITV, who NITV is. And it's interesting, um, now that we're turning 13, we've had a generation of children, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, that have grown up with NITV, um, that NITV exists in their world. So, you know, um, it, it's interesting. I've got staff members, young um, interns that, you know, what made you come to NITV and they said, oh, we love NITV. We've been watching it since we were kids. So it's interesting. I'm thinking, am I that old now? But it's, um, it's, it's uh, also in the biggest scheme of things, I think Australian, children, Australian kids deserve to see themselves, let alone Indigenous children need to see themselves a part of the world that they live in and be a part of the world as well. And, you know, you really didn't have, um, you know, that opportunity to see young Indigenous children on Australian children before NITV yeah. in, in yeah. a scale, in any sense of the word. So are you planning to commission more children's TV if your budget allows? Is it a priority for you? If I could have my wish, we'd double our children's budget. We need, and when I create this children's strategy, it's up to tweens and teens, and it's, you know, putting Indigenous children, Indigenous young people first, but it really is important for all Australians. Sport, your new sport show. Tell me a little bit about that. In brief, yeah. what are you trying to achieve with it? 
Yokai Footy is more than a footy show, is like what we like to say. Um, but seriously, it is um, what's so unique about it. It's a partnership direct with the AFL, um, which has a, you know, we've worked with them. They have an Indigenous media unit that they're evolving within the AFL now. And what we've done with this is about, you know, going to younger audiences and, um ensuring that we can find the content or find the audience through the content. So the partnership with the AFL means the distribution model is not just on television with NITV. We have a whole lot of, um, you know, stories of Yokai footy all over the AFL channel space. And, um, you know, for the AFL, they've been, you know, really wanting to connect with the community around AFL. So not just about the AFL and obviously the um, Indigenous community has contributed hugely to the game of AFL. Um, and the show is it fresh. It's it's um, new perspectives. It's, in, um, you know, you've got um, a young, um, she was a former CEO of AIM, Bianca Hunt, and um, it's, she's uh, really passionate and fiery, really popular on TikTok. So it's a different sort of, um, you know, approach to um, who's hosting a, a show. And, you know, I think it's, it's new. It's launched during COVID. So, I know, I know. What a challenge that must have been. I know, I know. It was so challenging. Like the team looks so down Hearted. And I said, let's just go. Let's just, there's one place you can really test and try is NITV. So yeah. the AFL have, you know, put all their heart and soul into trying to make it work. Um, we've done what we can and we want to keep growing it and trying to find that audience and, you know, keep the AFL fans that we've been um, supporting throughout the years. Um, you know, NITV has always commissioned um, shows that really um, reflect Indigenous success and the footy field is one of those places. Programs like Straight to the Plate, what, what are they important for in terms of NITV? I'm really excited about Straight to the Plate because it takes us into a world that we probably should be doing more of and that's the Torres Strait. And, you know, cooking, we all love cooking and it, it connects us the world over. But the way it's being done by Aaron Faso's company, um, it's, it's, it's more doco style. You get to know and connect with the communities and see the, the beautiful Torres Straits as well. So it's really important for NITV to um, reflect different diversities of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander life. And, you know, a show like Straight to the Plate gives you you know, a way to learn culture without even realising it and take you on that, you know, get you a bit hungry, but also <laughs> excited to go to the Torres Strait. Like, we've had huge success with a show called Going Places with Ernie Dingo, and Australian audiences are really loving being taken to community through the eyes of Indigenous people. And Aaron does that beautifully in Straight to the Play. It's stunning. Um, you know, it gets you on all the senses, uh, as Aaron would probably like to say. Um, <laughs> but also it's important for us to support a regional um, production business. So Aaron's company is based out of Cairns. Um, you know, he's national. He'll, he'll do stuff everywhere. But it was really important for me to get a Torres Strait Islander Rand production company to run a Torres Strait Islander production. And I think it ensures integrity and authenticity, and that's the brand of NITV. And, of course, for those watching, there's a session with Aaron talking about his production company that's actually up on Acme YouTube channel right now. So go and have a look. Now, finally, in the shows that I want to run through with you is something that's premiering on Friday, the 29th of May, when this show's going to air. And it's a massive show with, you know, one of the greats of Australian film and television, Warwick Thornton. And, it, you know, I guess, too, this sort of brings home how much NITV has achieved with showcasing talent. And tell me about this show. It'll be great. Looks awesome. It is one of those shows, it's like, it's hard to explain within a couple of minutes. It's, um, you know, you say Warwick Thornton. So if you think about um, years ago, like I remember the impact of when I seen the opening scenes of Samson Delilah yes. and, and then, you know, being traced through this journey of a world um, that, I, you know, I wasn't a part of and being exposed into it with very little dialogue. And he's, he's gone back to create 
this series for NITV in a similar sense. Um, but it's, it's very much um, pushing the filmmaking or documentary agenda. Or it's new for Australian cinematography. There, there hasn't been a series like this. And essentially in a world where we've all just experienced isolation, um, you know, Warwick did this for us last year. And it's about the importance of connecting to country and the experience of being on your own and, you know, what you need to do, that cleansing that occurs. And, um, you know, it, it fits. And what's really, what I love about it is just seeing Warwick, you know, he's going through, he's going through stuff, right? It's, it's a film that's very exposed. He exposes himself in a way like no other. And so basically the premise of the film, which is called The Beach, is he goes... Well, I mean, he just goes into isolation, really, doesn't he? For how long? It was quite a long time. Oh, yeah, it was, um, you know, six weeks or the like. So, it's a, yeah, it was, it was a while. He was, you know, he, he needed to get away from the city. Um, so he needed to get away from, I guess, so-called demons that he was dealing with. And um, it, what's interesting about this, he was, this was being shot by his son. So the cinematographer is Dylan River. Dylan River. Um, and it, it's interesting. I'd like to see the behind the scenes of the making up. <laughs> That's probably going to be yeah, um, the next, next bit. But um, yeah, it's, he, it's a long time by yourself in isolation and, you know, it's beautiful. So on the Friday of, as you said, 29th of May, Reconciliation Week, we're simulcasting um, the beach for the whole series. So six apps back to back. Wow. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting um, on SBS and, you know, we really hope people, you know, sit back and watch it in isolation with us, you know, keeping things simple and, you know, do it with their families and, you know, support NITV and SBS as we, you know, make history yet again. Sounds like a brilliant binge watch. Well, I guess my final question to you, NITV in 13 years has achieved so much. If you could think of one thing more that you'd like to achieve in, say, the next five years, what would it be? One thing? <laughs> <laughs> Silly me. <laughs> um, yeah, one is never enough. One thing. Uh, look, I really would like to create a channel that could get more Australians to engage with and really do it in a way of the pure, authentic, cheeky way that us mob do it. So I'm really hoping for all Australians sake that they can connect with the greatest and oldest storytellers on the planet and really grow the channel's reach and impact into more homes. Um, we're such a small channel. We launched in a world of, you know, new media coming through, um, which has also been our uh, benefit as well. You know, um, in that sense, I'd like to reach more. Um, in a content sense, I really would love my drama series up there, um, winning all the big awards and being, you know, the accolades. So we're 13, um, you know, we're, we're, we're that edgy little teenager at the moment. So we're starting to, you know, speak up a bit more and give people a bit more cheek. <laughs> so, you know, wait to see when we're about 16, 18, you know, once we really are, um, you know, coming completely of age, um, look out Australia. <laughs> What a perfect way to end, Tanya. It's been so lovely talking to you. As I say, I'm a huge fan of NITV and all the work you do. So please keep it up and whip that teenager along and get them to come of age. But thank you so much. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk of my favourite subject.